<laughs> All right. Let's go ahead and open in prayer, and we'll go ahead and continue our conference into uh, Jonah chapter 2. Uh, God, is we ever more appreciate not only the fact that you revealed yourself to the world, but that you had prophets, apostles, and other men inspired by you to write down the events of your interaction within creation. That is an honor we are not worthy of. And not only did you have it revealed and written down, but preserved over 2,000 years for us to be able to, to read, to contemplate, to discuss, to, to attempt to understand better your nature, your character, your activity, so that not only do we understand who you are, but we also comprehend your ways. In other words, your methods, your intentions, that you are well intended toward men. It is men who constantly within their own selfishness and sinful behavior and rebellion uh, work against you. Help us to take all this instruction um, and information so that we will be able to express who you are better, not only to ourselves and fortification, but to a world in need. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, once again, uh, chapter two of the Jonah Conference, The Bitter Prophet, A Fishy Tale, and The Compassion of God. Just in case you uh, ate food and uh, your brain is now in a sugar fog, let's go ahead and do a quick review. Or if you're just getting here and you want to go ahead and make sure you understand what happened in chapter one. If you don't know what happened in Jonah chapter one, I'm assuming you've been under a rock for your life, so... Even people who do not know the Bible at all know what happens in Jonah, right? So in Jonah chapter 1, we have Jonah receiving instructions from the word of the Lord. We talked about that word of the Lord um, uh, for a lengthy time, dealing with the fact that I do conclude that this is a Christophany, if not a Theophany, that this is actually God coming down in some form of physical form and having a discussion with his prophets. Um, but he, after receiving this instruction from the word of the Lord, he defiantly, and again, I don't think he was afraid. He's not reluctant. He's not apprehensive. He is an open rebellion, fleeing the opposite direction, fleeing from the presence of the Lord. He gets on a, he goes to Joppa first and then uh, basically buys a passage to Tarshish on, I believe, one of the ships of Tarshish. So he was dealing with individuals from that part of the country, not just some guys on a ship. While on the boat, a great wind and a great storm starts to batter the ship. The sailors find out that Jonah, who feared Jehovah Elohim, the Lord God, was running from the presence of Jehovah. That is, from the face of God. Uh, his actual, because remember, he manifests himself. Obviously, he's omnipresent. He, there's nowhere we can go that God cannot see. But the presence of the Lord is something uh, that is, especially in the Hebrew text, unique, uh, both within the idea of, of, of uh, Adam and Cain, Abraham, Moses. They all have a, some type of personification or some type of manifestation of the presence of the Lord. And Jonah was not running from God, okay? Although we, 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 we borrow that type of language when we're doing things wrong. No, he's running literally from the presence of God. Because he was there in the midst of Israel. Um, so then the solution that Jonah gives, it seems unreasonable to the sailors. But eventually the sailors relent to the prophet of the Lord. And through the supposed death of Jonah, they are preserved. I'm not going to get into Christology with that one. I just found that to be interesting, right? Throw someone in death. Now, the, why is that not a Christology? Uh, Jonah's not innocent. <laughs> He's the guilty party. They are obeying the prophet of the Lord. And so by doing this activity, they express an understanding, a belief, and obedience to Jehovah. And therefore, their life is preserved by them taking the activity of throwing Jonah into the water. That is why I believe that Jonah says, you have to do it if you want to be preserved. I could jump in, but that may not, but that would not save them. They have to act in obedience as well. The sailors afterwards greatly fear. They have a new respect for Jehovah. 
They make sacrifices to Jehovah and they make vows to Jehovah. I, I This is now another one on my list. I, I make a list, by the way, of people I want to talk to in heaven. I want to talk to these sailors. You know, Jonah would be an interesting person to talk to, but, you know, what about these sailors? What was your experiences after this? How did this, how, how did it, how do you end? What's the rest of your story? You know, do the whole Paul Harvey thing with them. About half of you understand what I meant by Paul Harvey. Do you even know what I mean by Paul Harvey? Good <laughs> I'm, I'm sure some of you go, he knows who Paul Harvey is? It's amazing. So after the sailors do this, where's Jonah? He's in the depths of the sea. But God does not leave him there. God does not leave him to die. We'll talk about that in a second. Rather, God appoints a great fish, a great fish, a fish, to swallow Jonah. And Jonah is in the stomach of the fish for three days and three nights. So before we get to chapter two, let's talk about Jonah 117 a little bit more. Now, why am I doing this? Well, because in the Hebrew Bible, if you actually have a Hebrew text, uh, 117 is actually 2-1. And I agree with that because the the events of one lead to the to the events that happen in the, in the belly of the of the fish, and so seventeen kind of like uh, kind of like is the bridge verse. So at the end of one, at the beginning of two. So verse seventeen, the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was in the stomach for three of the fish for three days and three nights. Let's talk about the first the word. Mana. That is the word appoint. Um, it's not manna. Okay, it's a different word. That means what is it? And it's the bread from heaven, right? So this is the word mana, and it means to appoint, ordain, set up for a purpose. Now, here's an, it, some, some interesting thoughts that have come out from this idea of a, of a point. The word is used uh, four times in the book of Jonah, an appointment, all right? Um, I'll just go ahead and show it to you. It's stealing a little bit of next hour's thunder, but I'll go ahead and just share it with you. Uh, chapter 4, verses 6 through 8. So the Lord appointed a plant, and it grew up over Jonah to give him shade over and deliver him from his discomfort. But Jonah was extremely happy about the plant. Yay, plant. But God appointed a worm. And when dawn came up the next day, it attacked the plant and it withered. When the sun came up and God appointed a scorching east wind, and the sun beat down on Jonah's head, so they became faint and begged with all of his soul to die, saying, death is better to me than life. So this word appoint seems to have, a obviously, a, um, a divine, supernatural in influence upon what he is doing. And what it has kind of led to was the fact that these things are special or unique. OK, was the fish a different species than any other uh, any other species? Well, was the plant different? Did did Jonah go, wow, you appoint this plant? I have never seen such a plant. No, it's probably in, a, in the Bible it calls it a gourd. It's kind of like this kind of like a big leafy plant that gourds grow out of. Kind of like if you ever see the kind of the leaves of a, of a pumpkin or uh, some type of other gourds, they, they can get rather large. I don't think it was anything that was um, unique in Jonah's eyes. I don't think the worm was unique. The east wind definitely wasn't unique. Okay? So the word appoint does not mean a special organism, a special thing, something unique in the world. Rather, the word or the word or appoint is the idea of being used for a particular purpose. Okay? A particular purpose. And what this means is that God is directly involved in the creation process for the lessons in Jonah's life, but it does not mean he's using a unique animal. So I don't think that he got appointed the fish means he made a special fish for this purpose. I think it simply means he appointed one of the fishes in the sea, the one that was capable, to go and swallow Jonah. That's all. I, I, he just gave that fish a particular purpose. So once again, the word does not indicate a unique animal, but a unique purpose, that appointment. Okay, Same idea when he appoints man. He didn't make a special man. He just, he just gives it a special purpose. 
Now let's talk about the great fish. Dealing with the idea, if this is a whale or a fish, okay? So katos, again, it's not the typical word for fish in Matthew 20, 40. Uh, katos is used in the Septuagint for the great sea creatures in Genesis 1, for tanin. And it's also used in Job 3, 8, Leviathan, okay? So when you say Leviathan, you're not referring to a creature. You're just transliterating a word from Hebrew. And we can guess what that is. Is it a dragon type of idea? Um, and so, so the word itself, katos, does not necessarily mean or does not mean whale. Because we could obviously see in Job 3.8, it's not a whale. However, Genesis 121 may be referring to whales. Okay? Now, some people have said, well, since it's used in Genesis 121, Leviathan, then, then, jo then Jonah got swallowed by a dinosaur. Like a, like a, a platosaurus type of thing, a, a, a kind of a, a seagoing uh, dinosaur type creature. But it said, but here's my problem with that. In Jonah, it says fish. Okay. So, Katos is not ever translated for a dog or dogga, except in Jonah. But it's definitely fish, according to the Hebrew text in Jonah. But of course, Jesus refers to this as a katos. Now, what is a katos? I would say the best translation for katos is monster. To which, I'm. how many here like to go fishing? Ever caught a monster? Sure you have. You, you catch little minnows, but all of a sudden, oh, I got a big one. You got, look at that monster. It's an expression, a term. It's larger than normal. It's a, it's a big one. It's a, it's, you're, 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 you're basically dealing with a word that means something of large or great size in the word katos, specifically that of a sea creature. So can a katos, um, can a fish be a katos? Absolutely. A great fish, a big fish, a monstrous fish, one capable of swallowing a human. Are all katos, are all fish katos? No, that's a different kind of concept. Okay. All elephants have ears. If you have ears, are you an elephant type of idea? Okay. So once again, a fish can be a katos, but not all fish are katos. You have to be a large man eater. Is it a Maglodon? Basically, one of those ancient, um, you know, huge sharks. You see the pictures of people standing in the jaws of this shark. Your guess is as good as mine. Is it a whale? Based upon the words used in Jonah, I would say no. Now, there's a whale shark, which is still a fish. It's not a, it's not a whale. It's not a mammal. It's a, it's, a, it's a whale shark, which is a fish, which is big enough to swallow a human, for sure. But my guess, my conclusion is fish, not mammal. Not, not a dinosaur in this situation. Now comes the question, and I'll, and I'll go back and answer this question first, because I want to deal with this first. Did Jonah die before being swallowed by the fish? Did Jonah die in the fish? It's a it's it's a it's an argument made from inference that in verse 17, okay, verse uh they basically picked him up and threw him in the sea. And based upon some of the language in the prayer that's coming up, it appears as though Jonah died and was resurrected in the belly of the fish. We'll talk about that in, in just a moment. But I'll tell you this: the, the language does not support that he died. The language supports he was thrown in. Now, some people say, well, he may have been in the sea for a couple of days or for a long time before the fish swallowed him. It doesn't say that, although it doesn't exclude that. You're, you're basically, when we start doing this, that type, of, that type of question, did he die or not die before he was swallowed? We're dealing with just basically what we think might have happened. And basically, the overall text means he got thrown in the sea and God had a, a giant fish swallow him. That's it. What else can we get out of there? Not a whole lot. 
We'll talk about the what he prays and, and kind of how he speaks in chapter two. So when we deal with kind of the idea of Jonah and the and being swallowed by the fish and and being and dying or not dying, um, don't don't make a, a major out of the minors, so to speak. Ask the question. See if it's there. Try to answer it. If you if you're convinced that he died, I'm not going to say he didn't die, but if, if you're, I'm not convinced he died. I don't, that doesn't seem to be um, built up upon the text. But let's go back to the question of the fish. Being swallowed by a fish and surviving this. Is this possible? Could a person be swallowed up by a fish for three days and three nights and survive? Have you ever seen this? They've, they've done uh, like Christian television shows you know, apologetics, scientific, they actually go through this. And they go, well, you know, if there's oxygen capture, uh, how much oxygen, oh, the oxygen going through the gills will kind of filter into the belt. Stop it. Okay. I'm sorry. Anybody who knows the digestive system of any animal, you cannot survive that for three days or three nights without supernatural intervention. That's not possible. Okay. It's kind of like, Trying to find out whether or not how, how Lazarus could have come back to life scientifically. No, that's not the question. How, how the Red Sea was parted scientifically, that's not the question. God says he appoints. God gives a purpose, and he is the one who is actually participating in this activity. I don't need to have scientific apologetics to determine whether or not this is possible. And I think it's also futile. What are you going to do? How are you going to run that experiment? You know, get a sea bass, you know, stuff a, a breathing animal in there, throw it in the ocean, try to catch it later. You know, even if you want to do it in a sea, it, it, no, and it, it never, it, it won't work, all right. And even if it didn't work, what are you trying to prove? If it did work, what did it prove? People have questioned the story of Jonah probably more than they questioned the story of Noah, right? Jonah seems to be this one that I'm like, oh, you really believe that somebody swallowed by a fish? Yes. How, how can that be? I go, do you believe that God created the world literally out of nothing in six days? Well, yeah, of course. Then why is this impossible? If we're going to be talking on an apologetic level, now if I'm talking with an atheist, that's a totally different thing, obviously. You know, I don't start with Jonah. <laughs> I start with creation. But if I'm talking to a Bible believer who simply just thinks that Jonah is Hebrew myth, a fable for a, a, a lesson, do you believe Genesis 1? Yes. Then Jonah 1 and 2 is not difficult. This is easy stuff. So again, I do believe it's frivolous to debate what kind of fish it is or talk about the, the aspects of digestion or oxygen depletion or the makeup of fish digestive systems. I think it's futile. If God can create out of nothing, then this is easy for God. There is nothing too difficult for Jehovah. And so my conclusion is, this is not that fishy of a tale. All right, we'll move on. Jonah chapter 2. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the stomach of the fish. In Jonah chapter 1, what does it say? I fear the Lord. Here, he prays to the Lord his God. That's pretty literal there as far as how that's captured. He feared Jehovah Elohim. This time, Jehovah is personalized to jo Jonah as his God. Does it mean he wasn't his God before? No, but it definitely has this uh, specific ring to it that Jonah is kind of like dealing with the fact that Jehovah is his God. He's it's kind of like that recommitment type of concept here. OK. So Jonah prayed to Jehovah, his Elohim. And now the, here's the question. When. I think this will kind of throw you for a loop too, right? Like this, this is kind of amazing. Here's how I always kind of picture this. You get swallowed by a fish. 
What's your response? Help! Right? Get me out of this thing. <laughs> well, why am I in here for? Why am I not dead? I'm not dead, so obviously I'm here for a purpose. Get me out. That'd be almost an immediate response. However, notice the word, the first word in the NASB is what? In verse chapter 2, verse 1. Then. Huh. Well, the then is actually a, um, the, it, it's attached to the word prayed. Okay? And remember in Hebrew, there are suffixes and prefixes attached to words that kind of add uh, like the, the timing of the thing or the sequence of the thing or the intensity of the thing to it, okay? The word then is based upon what's called the, the vav continuative, and it's with the imperfect verb. Um, I don't know how to necessarily pronounce that. Um, whatever. Basically, this is the Hebrew form of the verb form of uh, pray with this add a little notch to it. Literally, it's just a right there, right in front of the word, Hebrew word. It's called the wav, uh, vav, if you want to get more pronunciation correct. And it means sequential. Sequential to what? Typically, when you have a vav uh, uh, sequential uh, connector and or then, it points back to the previous verb. The previous verb mistakenly gets attached to the appointed. Actually, there's also a was. So the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow join up. And then with the was, there's also another vav with an imperfect, basically a continued vav right there. And so he appointed, Jonah was, that verb is, is there, okay? It's a, it's a chaya from the, pre, from the basically the, 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 the came existed was in the stomach then jonah according to the text did not pray for three days and three nights do you get the implication here what's jonah doing for three days and three nights is he just sitting there unconscious did he come into conscious after three days and three nights? Personally, I think he's waiting to die. Just let me die. Just let me die. Just let me die. Just let me die. Doesn't mean he didn't pray. I think his prayer was, let me die. I mean, how many times did he ask for death after this? So this prayer is connected to the previous verb, but after the action of the previous verb. So therefore, the prayer that he gives is after he was in the stomach for the fish for three days and three nights. In being cast into the sea, there is nothing to suggest that he suspected he would survive. Being swallowed up by that fish would have been a unique experience. What kind of experience can you can you put into the idea of being swallowed by a fish? And why does it take him three days to pray? I put this in the category of being extremely stubborn. The epitome of stubborn. I know it's epitome. I, was, I, was, I, didn't, want to, I didn't want that to hang too long. People go, wow, he is really an idiot. No, I am not going back for three days and three nights in the belly of a fish. And this is where I get into like the tactile concept of this, right? When I, when I, when I sit there and read a story like this, I don't, I, I try not to, and I, this is what I'm going to encourage you to do so. Don't glance over the, the, the details that are left out. Think about it. What was this like? I, I try to put myself in Elijah, you know? I really like the, the the first time I ever heard something like this was dealing with Eric and dealing with Elijah, mocking the prophets of Baal. Sitting in a lawn chair, having a drink with a little umbrella, they're going, why don't you call, maybe he's in the bathroom, that type of stuff. You know, really kind of, he's mocking them, putting it in a mocking situation. You know, we always picture these men of God walking around with staffs, 
thus says the Lord. No, Jeremiah walks in. He's a nutcase, okay? He's an absolute loon. Ezekiel laying on his side. What are you doing, Ezekiel? Showing you what happened. What? These people, they're not always presenting themselves as the most. It's, it's comical at times. Now, this situation here, I have to ask, what was it like? Have you ever been in a, in, a, in, a, in a sensory deprivation chamber? Have you ever tried to put yourself into a, a completely dark and soundless room? Where you're just there with nothing? No music? No sight? No sound? Maybe some gurgling? How do you handle that? Not to mention the cramped nature of this. Have you ever have you ever been in a in a cramped car where your knees are up against your chest? What's the one thing you want to do? What's the one thing you pray for? God, just please let me stretch out my right leg. It is it, it doesn't take long for those hips, those knees, those ankles, those joints to just lock up. Not to mention the sensory deprivation, the darkness and and just gross, right? The sinew, the, the 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 bile, the digestive juices. You're just sitting in this, and and basically kind of like the bush that didn't burneth. He's in the digestive. System. He's in there, but not digesting. Now maybe he's losing some hair. Maybe he's turning a little green. I don't know, but he's not dying. Jonah's cramped. What, what about the barometric pressure of going down into the sea? You ever ever, ever go down into like uh, into like a deep pool? Has anybody had this issue with their ears? You know, you just feel the pressure and you're like, ah, and, it, and it's an, it's immediate and almost um, extremely um, difficult pain. You just, ah, just the, the pressure just gets to you. Did he have the bends when he got out of there? I don't this, this is the type of thing I ask. Why? Because when we're, when we're dealing with a story like this, we, we teach it as kind of this fable idea, science fiction. This happened to a real guy. He really experienced this. And, it, and he is in pain, suffering, difficulty, dark, sensory deprivation, gross conditions. And it takes him three days and three nights for Jonah to relent. This is why I call it the epitome of stubborn. God, you want me to go back to Nineveh. I will not. I will not. I will not. I will not. Just let me die. I will not. Three days later, he cries out. I want to meet the guy who can withstand that type of pressure. And he said, I called out of my distress. I called out of my distress to the Lord, and he answered me. I cried for help from the depth of Sheol. You heard my voice, for you had cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the current engulfed me. All your breakers and billows passed over me. So I said, I have been expelled from your sight. Nevertheless, I will look again toward your holy temple. Water encompassed me to the point of death. The great deep engulfed me. Weeds were wrapped around my head. I descended to the root of the mountains. The earth with its bars was around me forever. But you have brought up my life from the pit. O oh Lord, my God, while I was fainting away, I remembered the Lord. And my prayer came to you in, in, in two your holy temple. Those who regard vain idols forsake their faithfulness. But I will sacrifice to you with the voice of thanksgiving that which I have vowed I will pay. Salvation is from the Lord. Now it's interesting because did Jonah repeat this prayer? Is this something he would just, you know, have on repeat? Was this a one-time thing? Doesn't really say. So he prayed this prayer. Is this a synopsis? Is this just basically the highlights? What we have is enough to understand that Jonah relented and that he recommitted himself in the prayer to doing what God commanded him to do. <laughs> 
Jonah's prayer is not, even though he prayed this, is not really his own. Jonah's prayer is a compilation of quotes or allusions from the Psalms. I have all the different references. And instead of just going over that uh, over each verse and kind of showing you where it's from, I want to just read to you the compilation of the Psalms. I want you to see that what he is saying is taken directly out of the Psalms. Psalm 18, 5 through 6. The cords of Sheol surround me. The snares of death confronted me. In my distress, I called upon the Lord, and I cried to my God for help. He heard my voice out of his temple, and my cry for help before him came into his ears. 42.7. Deep calls to deep at the sound of your waterfalls. All your breakers and your waves have rolled over me. 62, 1 through 2. My soul waits for silence for God only. From him is my salvation. He only is my rock and my salvation, my stronghold. I will not be greatly shaken. Psalm 116, 3 through 4. The cords of death encompassed me, and the terrors of Sheol came upon me. I found distress and sorrow. Then I called upon the name of the Lord. O Lord, I beseech you, save my life. Psalm 16, verse 10. For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol, nor will you allow your Holy One to undergo decay. Psalm 30, verse 3. O Lord, you have brought... My, brought up my soul from Sheol, you have kept me alive, that I would not go down to the pit. Psalm 31, 6 through 7. I hate those who regard vain idols, but I trust in the Lord. I will rejoice and be glad in your loving kindness, because you have seen my affliction. You have known the troubles of my soul. Psalm 3, 8. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Your blessing be upon your people. Salah. What did Jonah do? He basically took all of the kind of the water references and just started repeating these psalms. Most of the psalms are written by David. Was David in the breaches of the water? Did David go down to the pit? All of those references of the pit and Sheol is basically at the point of death. Death is threatened. And all of the prayers by David, all those psalms by David, are basically in and kind of um, extolling God, praising God for his salvation from those pits, point of death, chased around, hunted, and yet saved. Jonah's language here is not that of, of his own personal language. It's actually using the Psalms as prayers based upon his current circumstance, which David he used as kind of a figurative sense, and almost for, for, for uh, Jonah, it's almost a very literal sense, dealing with the breakers and, and the sea and the overall concept of, of on the verge of death due to the waters engulfing him. A couple of points in Jonah chapter 2, verse 2. Out of my distress. <clears throat> it is the Hebrew word, Sarah. With the men, distress. So in composition, this is Miss Sarah. Your distress. It's, uh, it's actually, it's kind of like a, a Miss Sarah. Uh, and so it's, uh, it's it, the word itself means not out of my distress, that I'm calling upon the Lord out of my distress. He's calling upon the Lord because of my distress. In other words, I've had enough. Um, he, is, uh, he is a broken uh, steed. 
He is obstinate, stubborn, and fighting. And finally, it he's just broken. And he's going to relent to the leading, to the direction, to the specific instruction of the Lord. Now, where a lot of the, the questions come in is because the recording of the Jonah's prayer is in the call or PL stem in the perfect voice. Mood, sorry, perfect mood. Now, a call or PL is typically a simple verb, depending on, on active or passive, that has been completed. I cried, you answered. So this is where a lot of people say, okay, he prayed this in the ocean. God responded by swallowing him up by the fish. But he prays this three days after being in the belly for the fish for three days. Again, if, if we want to go ahead and argue that he, that, he, that he died or on the cusp of dying, he prayed this prayer while being in the ocean, then, then why does it say after being swallowed by the fish? It, it, something's not going to add up if you're going to go ahead and try to go that direction. Typically, though, when a prophet prays, have you ever noticed this, that a prophet or a prophecy is given, or when God promises something, how is it normally stated? As if it already happened. The prayer itself is, again, quotations from David, most of them from David, dealing with the Psalms. What happens when you deal with this, this kind of concept? The prayer is in the midst of this fish, and Jonah prays as if the deliverance has already taken place. That's how he's praying this prayer. It's already completed. What does that mean? Well, the fact that he's not dead means that he is given opportunity, okay? Right off the bat, he's not dead. He's still conscious in the belly of this fish. It means he has opportunity to recommit and go his way and go the, the way of the Lord. The two aspects of this observation, it, it the, the prayer itself shows confidence based upon an understanding of both the capability of God and the will of God. In other words, can I pray? Okay, let's go ahead and say, on the way home, God forbid, right? I get into a car accident and I'm hanging from the, 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 the bridge of the river going, God, thank you for saving me from this peril. I know that I'll see uh, my kids again. Can I pray that? I understand the capability of God, but is me surviving that accident the will of God? Can't say that. I don't know that. I haven't been communicated. Jonah understands he has a mission and God is not going to let him not do it. So therefore, he can pray a prayer of, I know I will survive this situation because he understands the will of God and the capability of God. What can we pray understanding both the will of God and the capability of God in a similar situation? I know I will see my mom again. And I can pray as if it's already happened. Why? Because I know the, the capability of God of both saving both my mom and me that we're saved. And I know the will of God that those who will have passed before, we will meet again in the air and thus ever be with the Lord. I know the promises of God. I know the will of God. Therefore, I can pray as if it's already accomplished because of both the will and the, and the capability of God that I, I understand that. Because Jonah understands both the capability of God and he knows the will of God for his life, whether he wants it or not, he can pray as if it's already accomplished. Number two, it's a prayer of recognition, Thanksgiving. Jonah is placing the spotlight upon Jehovah and removed pride from himself in facing God. He, about, in the future, he's still bitter. But he's no longer arrogant. It's kind of he's breaking down. God is breaking down those walls little by little, so to speak. The actual prayer itself is is pretty simple, and it is is 
if you read it carefully, even though there are some eyes, you know, and me's and, you know, I'm going to survive this. I descend the root. He, he, he noticed that everything that's bad is Jonah and everything that's good is God. I put myself in this situation. I descended to the deeps. You saving me out of that. Your judgments are right and holy. I deserve it. You're saving me from it. Now, to begin with, out of, out of, out of verse two, the word call, it's a simple word. It's the word um, kara. It's used eight times in Jonah. It's the word um, cry or call. And they call out, cry against Nineveh. The, so, the sailors told Jonah to call upon your God. The sailors eventually called upon Jehovah. And now after three days and three nights, Jonah calls upon the Lord. And what is his prayer? Well, let's go ahead and, and, and read, reread this again. Look at verse 3. We'll read verses 3 through 6 and make a few observations based upon what he says here. For you had cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the current engulfed me. All your breakers and billows passed over me. So I said, I have been expelled from your sight. Nevertheless, I will look again toward your holy temple. Water encompassed me to the point of death. The great deep engulfed me. Weeds were wrapped around my head. I descended to the roots of the mountains. The earth with its bars was around me forever. But you have brought me up to life from the pit, O Lord, my God. Um, I kind of include this in kind of stanzas, okay? So the stanzas of the prayers, it's because he's using psalms, which means they're songs, okay? They're put to, to beat and rhythm, Hebrew poetry. The, he's basically having this kind of song in his head. And so I have three stanzas. The first one is 2B. I cried from Sheol. Sorry, I missed a couple of slides there. I cried from Sheol. Sheol is not hell. Sheol is the grave. Okay? That's simply the place where the body goes to death. I cried from Sheol. You heard my voice. To be. The second stanza is three through four. Where he says, I was cast into the sea, in the depths of the deep, expelled from your sight. I will look again upon your holy temple. Stanza three is verses five through six. Death is inevitable in the water, engulfed, weeds wrapped around my head, down to the roots of the mountains, the earth with its bars around me forever. You brought up my life from the pit. So the stanzas are kind of done in this, in this judgment, salvation, judgment, salvation, judgment, salvation. Kind of, kind of methodology. See that? It's very much, again, the Psalms have a similar beat, similar patterns. You can see that in various different ways and in, in ways of how the Hebrew poetry works. Um, typically, again, it's, it's the typical stanza or prose versions of the Psalms used by Jonah as a prayer. And once again, I want to make sure we understand that this is not hell or Hades. This is not the reference. This is physical death. This is not spiritual death. Spiritual death is not the topic of Jonah. He is not worried about his everlasting soul. He's not worried about going to hell. He understands that death is better. I absolutely believe that. He is not, he's, he's not concerned about his eternality. He's, he's basically wanting to die so he doesn't have to do what God tells him to do with Nineveh. But then he relents. And he understands how God is preserving his physical life so that he can do the will of God. Interesting thing that I had to look up and, and really kind of ponder for a little bit. It was this weeds reference. The weeds were wrapped around my head. It's a reference to burial clothes. Wrapped around my head is a burial clothing type of reference. Um, his, his, his basically saying, if I die here, my burial clothing will not be linen. It'll be seaweed or weeds of the sea, if it will. His prayer moves on in verses 7 through 9, very interestingly. And a couple of different points here that, that really kind of uh, 
bring to light something very interesting. While I was fainting away, I remembered the Lord. And my prayer came to you in your holy temple. Again, there's, he's, he's basically restating what he already did um, in regarding to um, his, his prayer. Notice that there's no salvation here. He's simply saying, I remember the Lord. And I prayer, my prayer came to your holy temple. Those who regard vain idols forsake their faithfulness. But I will sacrifice to you with the voice of thanksgiving. That which I have vowed, I will pay. Salvation is from the Lord. Now, verse 8 in particularly is very strange to me. Oh, but wait, wait, before that, I'm sorry. Go backwards. I skipped a line. Uh, Jonah states, first of all, that his last moment, Jonah reestablishes himself through prayer. And he says, I remembered the Lord. Do you think he's in the belly of the fish for three days and two nights going, oh, wait a second, there's this Lord guy. Now I remember. No. Um, one of the, 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 the word remember, if you trace it throughout the Hebrew scriptures, and I think it's pretty obvious. Uh, the first place that I, call, right, that I recall is actually used in Noah. And Noah is on the, the boat, the ark, the barge, with all the animals floating around. And it says something strange. Then God remembered Noah. Remember, remember me teaching this? It's like, it's like I, I kind of kind of kind of strange, right? That all of a sudden God, you know, he's he's tearing up the world, you know, he's shaking it up really good, causing all these floods, and you know, oh wait, yeah, I, <laughs> Noah. Sorry. <laughs> you know. Took me a couple of months, but I remember you now. No, see, remembrance is actually a action word. Um, it's not a it's not a oh, ah type of word. It's an action word, a word uh, of, of of faithfulness. Forgetting or remembering God are words of faithfulness, not mental acknowledgement. If you forget the Lord, it's not like you, he's no longer there. You're basically forsaking him, especially in the Old Testament. Remembering the Lord means I'm going to do what he wanted to do. I remembered the Lord means I'm committing myself to your will and what you've, what you've commanded me to do. Now, getting to verse 8. Strange word. What, what's this here for? Those who regard vain idols forsake their faithfulness. Why is that here? He's in the belly of a fish. Why is he concerned about vain auto worshippers out there? Is he simply just contrasting himself, saying, you know, I will sacrifice to you the voice of thanksgiving? Is he just contrasting himself? Hmm. Possibly. He does, obviously, contrast himself with those vain auto worshippers. But why is this here? Why is this now in the prayer? He just said, I remember the Lord, meaning I am going to recommit myself to your will, I, okay, I believe that this is in anticipation of Nineveh. I believe that I am going to do what you've commanded me to do. Please, do not regard Nineveh. Do not help Nineveh. Those vain idol worshipers, do not take their faithfulness as anything. Destroy them. In the midst of a prayer, in the belly of a fish, his mind goes to, please do not save Nineveh. That's what I really think happens here. I'll do what you command. Do not save them. Jonah, on the other hand, will give sacrifices and be thankful. It's kind of hard to see the thankfulness in the rest of the book, but that's what he says. Jonah then concludes that he will recommit his, his, uh, his, his calling as a prophet. That which I have vowed, vowed. <laughs> so it happens when you read too quickly, that which I have vowed, I will pay. I will pay what I have vowed. Jonah will pay what he has vowed. I don't have the verse, but turn to Ecclesiastes chapter 5. Or I will, you can listen to me. Ecclesiastes chapter 5. 
Ecclesiastes 5, 4. Just a point of reference. When you make a vow to God, do not be late in paying it, for he takes no delight in fools. Pay what you vow. It is better that you should not vow than you should vow and not pay. Pretty sure Jonah remembered that. <laughs> it's better that I pay what I vow than not pay what I have vowed. And so he is recommitting himself to pay what he vowed. Jonah then concludes with, salvation is from the Lord. I don't have a problem necessarily with this translation. Uh, salvation is Yeshua. Okay. And there's a suffix that actually makes this word emphatic. So Yeshua, there's a little suffix after the Yeshua. Remember, you read it backwards. So there's a suffix after Yeshua in the actual text, which makes it emphatic, which you actually might translate this mighty salvation, great salvation. Great salvation is from the Lord. Uh, well, the word, there's a preposition of the word from. Uh, the, word, the preposition itself shows direction. And in this context, it's better understood as salvation to the Lord. And that is a, a phrase that basically is used in Psalms as in salvation belongs to the Lord. It reminds me of, of Acts chapter 4. There is, there is no salvation under any other name than that of Jesus, right? Of that of the Lord. So the salvation to the Lord means there's no other person where salvation can reside. Salvation belongs to the Lord. There is salvation in no other. This is his prayer. Then, then the Lord commanded the fish to vomit Jonah up on the dry land. Again, the swallowing and the vomiting, you would think, have a little more colorful language. It's so matter of fact, it almost kind of like, okay, <laughs> move on. So Jonah is freed from his fishy prison. Oh, I love the fish, the fish puns, right? Yeah. I, I, I guarantee you he only ate lamb for a while. I can't stand the, sm stand the smell of fish. You smell like fish. I know. <laughs> Let's go ahead and pray, and then we'll go ahead and break. Um, and we'll come back uh, in a half an hour for chapter 3 and 4. Let's pray. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for your word. Again, the, 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 the privilege it is to be able to read, to, to examine, to dig, to understand what's happening here according to your word so that we too can understand who you are better in the life of Jonah, his prayers, um, to take his life as both a true account, to empathize with his plight, to understand his failures, and also to see his reestablishment in accordance with your will. Lord, thank you for all you've done for us. Help us to learn and grow. And we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen.